Okay, I think we're going to begin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Inti Guerrero. I'm an independent curator based in Hong Kong, but uh, until slightly recently, I was also the associate artistic director of uh, independent art space in Costa Rica, and I guess part of the invitation of being here is related to this uh, alternative hybrid uh, institutions and platforms uh, that somehow I myself have been working with and uh, well there are two Hong Kong uh, based institutions uh, here together so I felt also close to them and I'm away from Vitamin Creative uh, who is uh, a co-founder of a gallery but we will see in the conversation that uh, it is a hybrid uh, context uh, um, a situation and that they've built uh, to, uh, together with the Kufang uh, in Guangzhou and it's now having a new face. Uh, this hybrid uh, place is becoming e even more hybrid in its new location. Aaron Seto from A4, uh, he's going to uh, speak of the uh, institution he, that he is now leaving, he's the uh, outgoing director of the institution and I didn't formally introduce uh, Cosmin uh, from Parasite, uh, uh, one of the institutions from Hong Kong, and Hamad uh, is here with us from HR Archive. Um, I asked them to uh, introduce uh, a little bit the spaces um, or institutions or platforms that uh, they're coming from, but I've asked them not to tell you in the same of let's say using the language of uh, a mission statement that you can probably access uh, on the internet or even for people who are in Hong Kong now or live here or visiting, you can literally visit uh, HR Archive, go online on HR Archive, visit Parasite, or One Joy is only two hours away, so uh, Australia is a bit far away. <laughs> but basically what happens when you're in these talks about institutions, uh, the complexity of institutions is uh, so dense in terms of experiences no? and of programs, uh, the level of exhibitions, talks, the level of affect, I do believe uh, in the experience of having worked in a small scale institution that there is a much higher level of affect deployed by uh, directors and staff members in relation to what occurs uh, in terms of the exhibitions, in terms of the program of the residencies, uh, rather than a big institution you know, where there's more bureaucracy and there's more layers of basically people and paperwork and then, let's say, this very humanity essence of uh, working with people and art and uh, projects, let's say it's more alive or how an artist from here in Hong Kong once said about art, independent art spaces in a debate in Hong Kong that happened, Parasite that happened like two months ago, he said that independent art spaces should be actually called um, elastic art spaces, about how these art centers or platforms have a level of elasticity that bigger institutions would not have. So, um, I just wanted to Let's start. Everybody has a little, let's say, a five minute, seven minute uh, introduction about their place. I think we can, we can say a lot in those minutes. So, Aaron, thank you. Thanks, Inti. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, I'm the director of 4A Center for Contemporary Asian Art. We're based in Sydney. We're actually based in, in Chinatown. Um, and we were established in 1996 by a group of artists. And we have, I suppose, uh, a relationship to the kind of political situation that was going on in Australia at that time. So 1996 is the year of, uh, of uh, an infamous maiden speech made by a parliamentarian in, in the Parliament of, of Australia. Her name was Pauline Hanson. She was a xenophobe. Uh, she was anti-immigration, she was um, anti-Aboriginal rights, and a whole, whole range of, uh, held a whole range of uh, xenophobic positions, which I think, though she's not the reason why we exist, illustrates the types of um, 
political situation that, that artists were really talking about and responding to at that time in 1996. So we, at that, at that very early period, led by artists, um, we had a very small shoebox of, a, of an office in, in Chinatown and from there began to develop ex ex exhibitions. Um, and, you know, so the, the, not the mission, but let's say that the kind of things that we do is, is, is really to make connections between the very local scene, the community that kind of immediately surrounds us in, in, in Chinatown and making relationships to the type of national um, artistic conversations and the national politics that is happening. Um, and then also making relationships to what's, what's going on uh, around the world. So our, our, we have Asia in our title, but the, the way that we relate to Asia is um, elastic. So we, we, I'm stealing all of your words in here. Um, the, 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 the history of, of Asia and Australia is, is, is quite um, uh, complicated. You know, it's, a, it's almost the, coincides with the history of um, uh, white colonization. So, so uh, you know, we're very interested in experiences of diaspora, uh, working with, say, Indian artists from uh, Fiji or Chinese artists in New York. So our concept of what Asia looks like is, is really driven by the types of personal relationships and the personal histories which artists carry with them. Um, we like to commission, and as a small organization, it, we find that this is what really makes us, um, what really drives us is to have, these, have, have close relationships with artists, to build relationships with artists up over a long period of time. Uh, so, for instance, we recently did a, a, a quite a large project with Young Jung Group, and um, you know we we raised it was a, it was an ambi really ambitious proposal that they presented to us, and and uh, we raised a lot of money in order to be able to help realise those um, realise the project. But importantly, it's not just about bringing work from elsewhere and presenting it in Australia, but actually really creating opportunities where artists might might be able to experience something of the his historical context which Australia finds itself, um, and, the, and the, you know, the broadening concept of Asia which, which the organisation is, is, uh, is interested in. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting that um, the first, um, let's say, foundational moment that uh, you describe is this speech no, of hatred uh, in Australia and how uh, as an artist or intellectual community, you, uh, in that moment, the people who founded the space wanted to react no, to a specific context. No, it's a, it's a context responsive experience, uh, which happens in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, how this alternative spaces or alternative voices uh, start to emerge now. What happens, for example, now in relation to what is also like a new wave of uh, nationalism that is a global condition of how nationalism is back. Like, is there something that uh, the institution is doing in terms, uh, maybe not directly on, in its program, but uh, let's say, what are the discussions behind or what's the new awakening of the institution on us regarding Australian uh, right-wing politics today? I think that the emergence is actually much more subtle than that. It's, um, it's not necessarily a response to to uh, th this particular um, speech, it's this is uh, this is evidence of, of a range of, of conversations that was going on at, at that time, and, and um, I think that we can highlight that particular speech as as, um, as, as an example of, of what was going on in the in the broader public. Um, as to what what we do now, um, we're very conscious of our of having a contemporary art space in a, in a part of the city which is not normally the audience for contemporary art. So, you know, we have 
um, where we're located, we're, we're proximate to major transport hubs. There's, there's uh, major populations of international students who are coming from everywhere who live in the southern CBD part of, of the city. And also when we look at the history of, of, of Chinatown, this is a place where uh, there were cheap rents and where uh, as people were being pushed out of other parts of the city, they came to to live and work in, in Chinatown, and predominantly Chinese. Now that cultural mix is changing, you, we, you know, Australia is such a multicultural um, uh, society that, that we have, uh, you know, a whole range of different, d d different communities that live in and around us. So, for, so we're conscious of this. We've done a number of projects where we have investigated the living conditions, say, of international students. So international students, um, a major, I suppose they're an index of a kind of economic activity, um, you know, that, that's big money. But that when you look at the types of cultural opportunities that happen in, 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 um, in Sydney, that they're, they're not catered for, and they're also almost invisible within, within the uh, way in which the city also seeks to, de to define itself. So we, we worked with Ruan Grupa and another uh, artist, Keg D'Souza, she's a, a Sydney-based artist, and they did a series of investigations into the, into, the local, um, in, into the local area, and this turned into a, a big project. So we liked it, you know, it was, a, it was a speculative, it was not a straightforward project. We had to, at the same time as working with the artists, we also had to work with uh, government stakeholders as well. And that's, I think, one of the really interesting things that we're able to do as a small organisation, to be able to manoeuvre, not just for funding, but also for strategic support through a range of layers of, of bureaucracies and, um, you know, yeah. You know, at, at the end of the conversation, we will talk about money itself, because uh, I think that um, we are sitting in a fair and there is a clear, in some cases, very already systematized relationship uh, with the art market in the context of the fundraising strategies of uh, most of these spaces. Well, we're going to speak now to uh, someone who comes directly from the market, but. The images that you are seeing, I just wanted to clarify, are not from Australia. <laughs> no, we would like to share with you. Yes. So, maybe. Uh, maybe you can tell us what we're seeing. And no, I was, I'm, I'm looking at this image and where Erin is talking, I thought it was very beautiful. And now we start to share and the, the space with the A4 and with Erin. But actually, it's a re very interesting when Erin talked about the Yangjiang group. And, uh, uh, who just had an exhibition in A4, and which also the artists we work with. And, uh, but actually, the image running here and, uh, is the new project we just developed and a couple of years uh, uh, We started three years ago and just realized a half year ago. And uh, so the architecture has been designed by Su Fujimoto. And uh, uh, it's located uh, two hours away from Hong Kong, and it's in the agriculture area. And, uh, but uh, so far we have done two shows, and one show with uh, Lee Kate, and uh, he's from Hong Kong. And uh, now the show with Ula for Eliasung. And uh, so he's, a, yeah, I mean, uh, but it's interesting, and what happened with these two shows, and we work with them both very closely, and in the future we will continue to do this, and they work with us for a long time and to respond to the space. And um, so, uh, but uh, anyhow, and um, so what you have seen here, I probably go back a bit later, a little bit more. And when I, when I got this invitation and to, to be in this conversation, I thought it was uh, kind of like uh, funny because uh, normally for a long time and uh, people consider me as a gallerist. So I'm not used to get uh, invited as a kind of a curator, even though I graduated from a quick, uh, curating course. And um, uh, uh, since actually, uh, I have been, I think, dealing in the commercial sense for last already 20, 20 years. I started to involve in contemporary art in the 19, end of 1995, 
and one in China, even there is no food. I think I talked about this last year, and with the uh, AAA, when you had uh, you did the show with Hans Van Dyck, and uh, because Hans Van Dyck, and he was a Dutch person, and he came to China. Uh, like in the 80s and uh, research Chinese contemporary art and I started to work with him and that time there was really nothing so in order to survive and to do research and we have to do anything and to sell works and uh, everything we can do to get funding and we will do and to, in order to support and self-support because there is not any funding that time and then when um, after uh, I worked with him a couple of years, and I moved to Guangzhou, and which is uh, not far away from Hong Kong. And I realized that um, somehow, after I worked with some things, I want to work back and with uh, contemporary art. And uh, then, you know, like uh, then there is no infrastructure at all. There is no money. There is no gallery. There is no space, but only with art. You know, that's kind of interesting. I saw it like the artists from Guangzhou, they're very, very interesting. But then, you know, how we do this? So that time, and we gathered artists together, like Yang Jiang Group, and so we said, okay, we will collectively start a space. And uh, then we even did uh, design, and, uh, uh, and we did like um, all things, and uh, um, to, main, to get money, and then they, we talked about with them, and they said, okay, if everybody, we can sell the works, we will sell the works, and the works will come back to the gallery and to support program. And uh, it works actually well. And, uh, but at the beginning, you know, like it's interesting because we still towards to the art, and uh, uh, then luckily, like in three years later, and the, the fair, the art fair, and uh, freeze, and they want to have uh, another program, and uh, you want to invite like a uh, non-commercial uh, space involved in this. And we did this, and they invited us, and since then we found it was kind of like interesting how the art fair has a possibility or potential to create a situation which can deliver not only about the dealing, selling art, but it's also become a possibility of, uh, um, a, you know, like a platform of uh, open up conversations and uh, communications and to bring like uh, these weird ideas together. And uh, so that's how we continue this. And uh, um, I mean, this is also how, our, you know, like the funding, how we get it. But, um, but uh, go back to really like to look at the art system because we are not from the Western art system and so there is a really like a paper in China. So it's interesting, it goes back to the really basic philosophy, it's about the economic. So what economic is about exchange. So that's kind of interesting because we have been normally, but very often we stuck into a kind of like a, we understand commercial in a very narrow way, and we thought it's just selling and uh, buying. But in fact, you know, like as I found art institution, it's very interesting. It creates possibility of exchange, so exchange of understanding of art, and also exchanging of with like uh, the money. And uh, you know, it's uh, I think it's any institution involves in this, you no? Know? Like in one way and another. So then the question is, what deliver? We, we have commercial, but what do we, we deliver? We not only deliver art object, we deliver the idea of art and the experimental, experimental of art, the future ideas of possibility of art. And we kind of have like this, basically I think it's uh, also we live in the time of uh, sharing. So it's, um, and, uh, and then, that's kind of like uh, also artists' possibility they start to work with. And then it's a very kind of complicated, I mean, like this is a long, long, we can talk about long, but uh, the thing is, it's interesting what happens with the space you have seen here. It has been, uh, then we work with particular artists and they have particular ideas and it's very open. So basically the space you have seen here is we involve agriculture and all these different perspectives. 
and it's because of the artist practice in contemporary world and the contemporary art world they open a lot. So that's how their practice shaped the space of this. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you. Yep. Yinti, you ask question later because um, I cannot go thank on. You very much. Yeah. I think you brought a, um, uh, an important dimension of understanding the commercial, and uh, it w I wanted you to maybe share, and maybe some of the people in the room also understand that the contribution that Vitamin did. Um, in the early, well, in the 2000s was to create another market which was not existing somehow, uh, which was not having the same visibility as clearly uh, the forces of power of a dominant uh, Chinese art market. No? So uh, how um, were you creating, um, trying to build up, let's say, uh, another language that can uh, have other narratives, but also within the commercial field? No? Uh, like uh, even you said, like to build up a generation one young, uh, give them uh, the possibility of having, let's say, the mobility and not demonizing completely the market, but actually trying to create another market. Um, because I, guess, I, think I, I just wanted, yeah, because we talked about how it would be interesting for the people to try to understand, like, what was the context? Or let's say, what was the lack? Uh, or what were you responding to when uh, you opened Biden? Yeah. Because actually, I think like um, the market is like we never know what the collector want to buy, and I think we never know what we other people want to have. What we only can do is we know what we want to share with others, and uh, so that's very kind of important. And to stick on what you believe. But it's not like your ego, you know, like we have to really, I think that's interesting what art and also many artists practice today. And then they kind of like um, become like the artist self become a medium and to really sense um, what happens right now. And then they become medium to transfer this form and share with others. I think that's kind of like really amazing, like uh, but also I think what art create is a very different time as what market create. Because what art becomes is not to really make, to, how to say, um, attract and the audience rather than to open up and to share the experience, to create the experience, co-experience of explore, explore, exploring the, uh, the world and which we cannot see. I think that's a really fundamental kind of uh, a question into the, to understand the, uh, the art. And then I think it's quite, uh, then you see the uh, market very differently. Yeah. I think that uh, clearly the reason why you are in this panel is because there are very few, few galleries that would talk in that way. <laughs> you know, the, the level of understanding uh, you very insisting about uh, this idea of sharing and the new space in Guangzhou uh, is clearly um, a context of uh, creating literally like a micro village where experiences and uh, more relational uh, aspects of art and life uh, can happen rather than, I don't know, we were somehow comparing it also, maybe some people in the floor know the case of uh, projects like Inotim, Inochim in Brazil where also like there's pilgrimage to go into the woods and to go into nature and see grand installations within uh, big pavilions. And that's actually this exposure of the ego that you were trying to avoid. And I think it's a very interesting new platform of uh, sharing that uh, Vitamin Creative is still even imagining itself uh, continuously, like saying the gallery went into a, a certain aspect of becoming a gallery, but now it wants to again be alternative and become a hybrid. Why don't we pass to a parasite? So we're basically doing it geographically from far away to the closest. I don't know what's closest now. To yes. <laughs> so I think we are closer. Uh, no, 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 no. We probably are closer. <laughs> so uh, depending on the traffic. <laughs> Postman, um, it would be nice to know more because some people in the floor don't know the context of the 90s prior to 
uh, the handover in Hong Kong and how this artist run space uh, emerged and what was that context and how can uh, we understand the context today and speak about your position. You don't have to talk about specific parts of the progress because again, there's websites and things, but it's more of uh, how you see what is an art space such as Parasite in the context of Hong Kong today. Yeah, I think it, it makes sense to um, go back to the beginning or, uh, or to, in any case, to take a step back and to look at um, a, a sense of progression of the institution over the last two decades, especially since we are um, at the moment of transition and at, at, at an important moment in, in, in this history of Parasite uh, because we have just relocated to um, a different space, uh, something that the institution has only done well, once and a half somehow, uh, times before. Um, we also uh, started in 1996, like, like, like 4A Space, and we were also very much um, the result of, a, of, a, of the historic circumstances in the, in the context of the time. Um, but they were obviously different than the ones in Australia. Um, January 96, so the moment when, when Parasite opened, um, is quite a particular period of time, both in the history of Hong Kong and, and I think also in the, in the kind of um, international uh, uh, contemporary art um, logics and, 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 and history somehow. Um, in Hong Kong, this was a period of um, uncertainty, uncertainty and instability for, for several reasons. Uncertainty because it was one and a half years before the handover, um, the, the return of Hong Kong to, uh, to China. Um, and, and the period in which uh, the civil society in general and, and, and various um, uh, components of, 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 of society became more active and more self-organized and, and, and you know several initiatives in various other fields emerged as well so there's definitely a way of uh, a broader way of understanding parasites emergence as part of this wider phenomenon that is not so much related to um, the, the logics within the art system as it is more connected to a logics within from, from within uh, the broader Hong Kong society at the time. Um, but then still certainly um, um, there's, there's, there's reasons and, and, and motivations for, for, for Parasite appearing uh, within the art system. I mean, there's, there's a history of, of, um, of, of uh, initiatives and methods of organizations of artists in Hong Kong going back, you know, you know even decades. I mean, there's certainly a certain level of emulation at the very, um, you know, micro level somehow from the 80s and, 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 and you know, again, even, even before that. Um, but there is indeed this sense of instability, you know, that is somehow defining um, these institutional efforts. And probably, you know, this instability with the, with the uncertainty that, that, that I mentioned earlier are not completely two uh, separate phenomena. Probably the sense of uncertainty in, uh, in, 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 in the very fundamental you know, core of, of, of how Hong Kong society was seeing itself at the time, and partially even now, even if things have changed significantly, uh, was not necessarily uh, 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 conducive to building institutions or to being able to imagine institutions as, um, as we understand them, as, as you know, an, an organized form that is able to acquire its own memory, that is able to acquire uh, you know, a, a certain type of practices and it's, it's able to, um, to project a certain type of continuity for the artistic practices, for um, the, 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 the creation of audiences, for its communication with wider society. So, in that sense, um, the, the, the emergence of Parasite, at least at the level of the, of the arts, it indicated a, an, an, an effort to, to move from this, um, you know, highly shifting way of, of, of understanding uh, uh, a, a scene to a more uh, institutionalized, to a, to, to a more, you know, stable uh, formula. 
Um, this was not necessarily the intention from the very beginning, so it started as an artist-run uh, space. I, I think I didn't mention that, and it's of course cru the, 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 the crucial part of it, um, both because it, it was a, a very homegrown effort and, and, and because it was a collective effort and because it, 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 it was the product of a generation that, 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 that um, you know, felt the need for uh, such a platform to, to emerge. Um, how much time do I have? I One minute to talk about the context of today, I mean. Right. Well, I mean, this being the, 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 the foundational structure, the foundational mission that of, you know, um, um, serving in, in one way or another um, the various communities that that the, that, the, that the founders of Parasite imagine themselves being part of. And this is very important to say that, you know, it's not necessarily one community. There's always more communities and there's always a, a negotiation in, in defining the borders between these communities and they always change. So this is important in understanding the profile and the position of every institution, not just Parasite. Um, but we like to believe that this a uh, sense of, of responsibility has remained somehow unchanged as a, as a core constitutional mandate of the, of the organization. Now, considering that these communities have changed uh, dramatically over the last uh, uh, two decades, and uh, again, uh, every possible community that can be imagined as, as having been around Parasite has each changed dramatically from the way in which the neighborhood of Parasite has changed from um, in, in its first years in, of existence it was in a neighborhood in the on the western side of the island in Kennedy Town but then for the for, for, for the rest of the two decades it was uh, in San Juan on Poyan Street uh, which you know was one of the most local um, and, and, and residential small shop uh, um, parts of the old core of, of Hong Kong and now has become the, one of the most chic touristic areas of the city. So from, from the shift in that community to the shift in the local uh, art scene of Hong Kong now, which is probably the most obvious community that you imagine in relation with Parasite, which has also changed dramatically in this period from, you know, being um, an embryonic ephemeral association of uh, of, 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 of a few precarious artists and very few institutions, if, if, if at all, to being this, you know, whatever we are now, this, this metropolitan center of sorts, um, to also the way in which the international art scene, which is also a community in which Parasite has, was imagined from the very beginning, so to the way in which this has also changed over the last two uh, decades, because the sense of a, of a global art world is also not a static uh, geography and it's also not a, not a static animal, but it's also one that is shifting uh, and has shifted considerably over the last two, two decades. So basically, in order for Parasite to remain faithful to this idea of, 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 of responding to, to this reality surrounding it, uh, it had to change a lot as an institution and it had to to, to, to refine and adapt its, its strategies and, and programs and um, way of operating in several ways. I think uh, a subject not to discuss here, but uh, which is a panel in itself is like in relation to what happened in the 1990s in the model of the uh, artist run space, no? Because uh, it was clearly a phenomenon institutionally that happened globally. Uh, how these collectives emerge in a certain way and proclaim, uh, well, let's say that artist spaces and clubs since the 30s or 20s existed with the avant-garde, no, but this notion of how we understand today the artist-run spaces, the, the notion of the alternative is very related to the 1990s and maybe perhaps it's because it's that decade just before how we understand uh, the forces of market today, the, the notion of being alternative really in the 90s was kind of like in the age of that there were possibilities of imagining different forms of creating uh, signs and symbols and uh, significance of how we produce art and creating spaces that didn't exist. I'm gonna pass to Hamad, uh, who is from HR Archive, but 
uh, has in itself uh, a background as curating and also um, um, within a space, uh, like co-running, running a space, no? Um, uh, Hamad, well, as I said before, in this panel of an hour, we will never, the idea is not to, you won't get informed about what each institution does because, again, the amount of activity that happens, and especially Asian Archive, which has the regional scope, the level uh, of knowledge that is produced um, is even humongous. No? Uh, in the case, uh, I think, of Asian Art Archive, the notion of the hybridity, of, which is in the title of our, uh, of our salon, uh, is in relation to how it also plays a role in different aspects, not only of the art world itself, but also within academia, uh, a possibility for scholars to get acquainted and basically have the resources for research that perhaps uh, they're not available in the current or other forms of uh, academia. Uh, and um, uh, I'll just pass the mic. Yeah. We had a discussion before. I just wanted, yeah, I just wanted to add something that uh, HR Archive um, also used to do the talks program of the art fair before the art fair was bought by Art Basel. And uh, the, there's an existing alternative model within the existing, let's say, more corporate <laughs> art fair, uh, which is uh, on the hallways. And maybe we can start a discussion from there, no? on what's happening there and how you see it being played in relation to the fair. Um, why don't I end there and start the discussion elsewhere? But, but, I, but I will, I will t take up that invitation. Um, uh, Asia Art Archive um, uh, started in the year 2000. Um, and its co-founders, who are both Hong Kongers, um, uh, Claire Su, uh, who's uh, the co-founder and still director um, of AAA, and Johnson Chang, who's, who wears many hats, and not unlike uh, Zhang Wei, as, as a gallerist, as a curator, um, and as a writer. Um, and what, what Claire in particular, who was then a student, was responding to was the lack. So she was doing a master's, wanted to look at um, write a thesis on contemporary Chinese art, was stumped as to where would anybody would find this material for research when she was doing uh, the master's in London. So out of that, I'll cut a long story short, the first uh, donation to uh, AAA was Johnson Chang's personal library. Uh, so that was 15 years ago. We are now um, a physical library, um, which is probably one of the most significant collections uh, of, uh, of printed material on uh, art, recent art in Asia. We have a digital collection, um, which is available on the website. So what does that mean? So this, this is um, photographs, these are scans of uh, documentation, uh, correspondence, uh, writings, that is up on the website, um, available for free, of people who open up uh, windows into art scenes. Um, so whether they be of India, of China, or generally of Asia. Uh, of Asia. And thirdly, and no less importantly, is um, research and programs, which is how do we decide what we bring into the archive? Because the archive is not an index, it's not trying to map uh, the world on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, we are selecting. Uh, secondly, and how do we take this out into the world uh, to make it work? Um, and as, as one illustration of that, um, I'll talk about the, the open platform um, uh, project that we stage in our booth uh, at Art Basel. So, and you'll find that near the sort of the bookstalls and institutions section, where what we do is, I mean, the, the booth, the Art Basel booth, is probably the most expensive real estate in the art world. Um, and for us, uh, and, and we started this model sort of three years ago, for us it was like, okay, how, what is the best way for us to use this expensive real estate in a city where expensive real estate is where we're at? Um, and, and what we came up with was the notion that we will open that up uh, and share, to, to echo uh, Zhang Wei's word, with, with, the, with the field, with curators, writers, artists, researchers, who want to have conversations that they may not always have access to. 
So we, uh, we put out an open call saying, you know, if there are topics that you would like to discuss, tell us who you would like to discuss them with. You don't even need to know all of these people, but some of them. And then we will help, uh, we will help you make those conversations happen. And so, so those conversations are being staged out in the public, so we call this like a, a meeting without walls. Uh, and so, you know, if you're, if you're passing by and if you're are interested in that, you can actually listen in, or you can introduce yourself to the people. And we, uh, you know, they don't even have to invite us. Uh, it will not be recorded. It will, uh, it's entirely up to the participants what comes out, if anything, in those meetings. So that's just one, one way of thinking about what we're doing. But what we're actually trying to do in some small way is to intervene into these lacks of knowledge infrastructure. Because we're sitting here in an art fair and one mode of art is very visible. So that is art as a, um, as a luxury good, which of course it is. One of, but one of the beauties of art is that art is so many things all at once. It is that luxury good, but it is that mode of inquiry, almost philosophical. It is a political proposition, uh, and it's also a form of knowledge. So it's as much part of an education as it is part of interior decor. Uh, and for us, I think, um, while it's been very, well, relatively easy to replicate some of the structures that cater to art as a uh, commodity, it's, it's very difficult to develop new structures of art as a form of knowledge. Uh, and what we're trying to do in some small way, uh, and not by ourselves, so it's not just Asia Art Archive as the, as the sun which will radiate knowledge outwards, but it's us uh, working in partnership with many, many similar initiatives, individuals uh, to large institutions, to think about ourselves as a node within a network of, of similar-minded people. And what we're, what we're trying to do is not just be, it's not just about what we collect or even what we do, but what we enable others to do. And it's not just ranging from sort of academic researchers. I think one of the most significant programs that we've uh, been developing over the last few years is actually aimed at secondary school kids. At the moment, we're looking at Hong Kong, and what we're working is with teachers. So Hong Kong actually has the benefit of a very ambitious and actually highfalutin uh, art history, art writing program which even if you compare it to say, Goldsmiths College in London where I did some of my studies, you would struggle to have that level of comparative art historical knowledge. But how do, how do secondary school teachers teach this stuff? Uh, and so that is a project that we are working with, is to develop uh, study packs and programs, and as we develop them, our idea is also to then share them with other parts of Asia, with, with India, with Indonesia, and those conversations will continue. But maybe I should stop here and, and wait for some questions. Well, thank you, Hamad. I think that um, it's more like have a discussion in relation to what has been spoken and you brought up like more the conscience of where we're sitting now, the fair. Uh, I think that um, this is even trying to create some kind of in, uh, uh, like interrogating a bit and to what extent the fair actually does create, uh, well, not only the luxury good or the, as let's say that people who pass by uh, as their experience with the object is not necessarily completely as if they were passing through duty free uh, and I wonder is because ever more and more and this from a very personal perspective I find that there's even even more historical works in art fairs no? so there's more works from the 80s and more works from the 50s and in a city here in the where there's an absence of a museum the masses of people do experience uh, a moment of international art, even if it's not necessarily, let's say, uh, informative or the captions uh, of the works don't place them in historical perspective, no. The experience of the era of the art fair somehow is creating, a, when they experience historical works, um, I say this to you, sorry. I say this to you because um, uh, what happens then when we see uh, artists from the 70s or the 60s and we see people that in some way or another they, do, they will encounter even if it's as a, a five minute, which may be a banal situation, but uh, there's tons of children today. I don't know if you've seen them. <laughs> and uh, uh, 
Like you would see the same situation in historical museums. Children will just pass by and walk around. Uh, there's something that is going on there. Uh, of course, yes, we are in this monetary uh, experience of art. And I just wanted to point out something that has always uh, surprised me about uh, this format, the name of where we are, of Salon, no? uh, how Art Basel appropriated the grand word of the grand exhibition. So it has two meanings. No? So the Salon being the main grand narrative of how a uh, part of Bozart uh, uh, officialist type of art happened and we're here talking about alternative models where the alternative precisely was outside of the salon, no? But the salon is also here in this, uh, it's also meant to be this uh, situation where we speak of our expertise and I think uh, the audience somehow, it's only an hour, so there's, there isn't a very few, there isn't actually space to, for the audience to speak. Uh, but it's this situation of like, um, I don't know, like appropriating actually very historical dominant words. No? Uh, something that uh, Cosmin, uh, you didn't say, uh, and it would be interesting to uh, point out in relation to what Hamad was saying about the lack. No? Uh, I think all of these uh, initiatives, they do, as you heard, they respond to a certain lack uh, of their given context and uh, Parasite has had, for example, and both Asia Art Archive, they're filling the gaps of a certain gap that happens of not having that museum, no? Uh, HR Archive actually collects, it's an arch it's, uh, information that is it, accessible uh, online and through the activities of lectures and talks. And in the case of Parasite, uh, there's a uh, exhibitions that are historical uh, research based about histories about uh, different genealogies of uh, Chinese uh, contemporary art and there was clearly uh, a lack that we heard in uh, other kinds so can you just talk about let's say the importance of having this uh, uh, especially these research based exhibitions where actually with Asia Archive uh, there has been collaborations I would, have, <clears throat> I would have said it if the moderator wouldn't have like spoken for half of our panel. <laughs> right. Um, no, well, it's true. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's, and I think it is even more, more interesting to mention not so much about the project that we did in the last few years, which indeed um, have this kind of heterogeneity of, of of, um, of, of, of types of exhibitions, of methods of exhibition, of, 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 of different vocabularies of exhibition. And the, indeed, this is a response very much to you know, the needs of the, of the, of the, of the context and uh, the, the situation as it is. Because as there aren't uh, that many um, non-profit institutions that are in the business of making exhibitions, um, Parasite still feels the responsibility of doing all the different types of exhibitions that you would encounter in a, in a context at once. So from uh, exhibitions that have a more art historical dimension to exhibitions that are um, interested in exploring through this language of, 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 of exhibition making um, um, and, uh, a subject that is present in society, in the culture, and, and, and you know, use this art to better understand that um, um, that particular topic to um, exhibitions where the focus is more on the actual practice of one or several artists, and where the, the, the forms of art are at the core of the of the of of, 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 of what leads the the, the curatorial um, uh, effort. So yes, I think. <coughs> This heterogeneity and this, uh, this, this multi-level, several hats at the same time is a direct result of the, of the, of the, of the needs and the lacks the, in the context. But this is also something that Parasite has been always doing. I mean, it had to be at the same time, you know, a museum, an artist-run space, a school of some sort, um, and, and, you know, various other structures at the same time. And it had actually... <coughs> 
a lot of the branches of the organizations, um, uh, it had actually several arms that appeared and disappeared at several moments of its history, and I think that the lifespan of these uh, structures um, is, is a reflection of like how the scene evolved as well. There was a, a magazine that, that Paris had ran called PS Magazine that ran in the late 90s, um, early 2000s, in a period when many institutions actually had this format of, of, a, of an institutional magazine, which was actually a very important platform for uh, critical writing, for, for art criticism in Hong Kong, when there were very few other uh, places where people could do that. And, well, that's not... Uh, any more the case, at least in this field, there are actually several platforms uh, uh, where, where, where people can do that. So this need is not longer there you know, for Parasite to, to have its own magazine that, that would be a catalyst for, for artists, art critical writing, for example. I just wanted to uh, thank you. I got a signal like this from the back, <laughs> like something like that. <laughs> And um, uh, thank you very much, especially for think, this concept of sharing is what we've tried individually and interconnecting uh, the discourses and the places that each of you represent. Uh, good luck with you on your new job. <laughs> and um, it was a pleasure. Excuse me? Well, I'm not allowed to tell the audience, but I don't know if that's still the rule. Can, can someone? someone can, can okay, yes. There's one burning question. question. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm currently a senior college student in Guangzhou, and I've been following Vietnamese creative space for a while. So uh, I have a question for Ms. Zhang. Uh, that uh, on my way to Vietnamese space, um, I I think the the process of getting there is. Um, itself is um, the process of art because it's kind of like, like um, hard to find it. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, could you explain a little bit about uh, why you have such a um, utopian like concept um, for such a gallery in in a commercial city um, of Guangzhou? Thank you. Art is not always easy. No, <laughs> it's a difficult thing. Um, no, I think that's also, I think uh, probably that's what Inti said, and uh, is really understanding about the space. And uh, so, particular for like agency or institution, and um, you know, we get used to know, understand the space is as a physical space, but um, art is not only as a commodity, you know, com com commit that you need a physical space to put in. I think what art carries is about our daily life experience, our imagination of the universe and the way how we're approaching of the life itself. So it's very complex and uh, universe in a way. And physical space is uh, too narrow and to carry this. How we really, how this art can, I mean, carry this experience. Because we, art is different as artwork. So like artwork is a transferring this experience, and I think in that location, whatever in the market, which is our daily life, or in the rural place, which we close to nature and get reference or inspiration for our universe, and both places are extraordinary experience, and for us to open our sensation or to understand in the world. So that's the reason we choose vitamin space in the market, and the new mirrored gardens is in the rural place, and we have another space which is called uh, Pavilion in Beijing, which is in the high building space, yeah. Like, locations can also, they vary, like, in terms of when the institution started. So I guess, like, in Chinatown in the 90s, the idea of having a space in Chinatown for a certain uh, art field, it meant, like, oh, wow, it's, it's there, you know, so. I guess the vitamin moving now to certain places because it feels that it needs to move to become, or in the case of Parasite as well, it needs to move to rethink itself. HR Archive, what we know is that it's looking for a place, a new space, because, well, there's a lease that's ending, <laughs> but because um, the displacement of an institution does create a, a position in the narrative. You know? 
over there. Is there one? Yeah. This is the last one we promise. Our bus. Thank you. I, I, I'm curious that, that our topic is hybrid and non-profit, right? But I, 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 I cannot see where is the non-profit. I mean, how it works, how you overcome your expenditure, and um, you said the um, in the past two decades, you, uh, the art environment became uh, uh, from selling and buying to some share exchange, but. Um, then, if, if so, how could you get the funding? Where where the funding comes from? I mean, are them mostly the government funding or some company? Uh, yeah, thank you. This is a whole topic. But well, maybe I can just give a one example of, of the archive. Um, the short answer: it's a uh, a whole combination. It's a bouquet of um, of options. Less than 10% of our operating costs, ongoing operating costs, are covered by the government. Um, more than half, on an annual basis, are covered by um, an auction. So here is the market, which is, if you like, it's, it's like at attaching a catalytic converter to a car. So, so it converts what is supposed to be a pollutant, uh, in a way, into something which is, which is different. Uh, so, so, so we're, we're using a market mechanism to fund a, um, a, to fund a non-profit activity because everything we do is free. And then there are a whole variety of things from corporate uh, contributions, sponsorships, to individuals, so patrons program. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's really a combination of all these things, uh, not any one. I mean, this is a whole discussion I said at the, at the beginning, but there was no time to like talk uh, about money. Uh, there, will, let's see that maybe next year. <laughs> there is a specific context about like, show me the money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but uh, they have different experiences. Obviously, things uh, related. I, uh, I would just add that it, it also depends on. Uh, the city and the society where those art spaces are located. Of course, in a financial hub where there are, let's say, more individuals for potential patronage or where there is a market, well, you can have an auction. Uh, in a space in Nicaragua, <laughs> uh, where, the, let's say, the level of economy wouldn't be the same, not the level of patronage of, uh, wouldn't be the same. So. It, it's, it's also, also like, like fundraising, fundraising as the programming or the position is also context responsive. No, uh, there are different mechanisms. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, and just an applause for our speakers.